This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is public broadcasting in the United States, NPR and PBS, whether it has lived up to its vision of 50 years ago and what its current state is. I have two writers who've written on this subject before, and we will discuss it in a moment. As I mentioned, the subject is public broadcasting in the United States. I have uh, two guests, uh, Adam Ragusi, is it, or Ragusa? Ragusia. Ragusia, okay. Uh, so Adam uh, writes uh, for, or is involved with something called The Current, which I guess, is that a watchdog group on public media, or? I wouldn't call it a watchdog. It's it's the trade paper of the public media business. It's okay. uh, been around for 35 years. It, it covers public media for the public media community. Okay. Well, uh, if you could give a little bit of a background about yourself, and your views on uh, the history and or current state of public broadcasting. Sure. So uh, I worked in public radio for about 10 years uh, in various capacities, and I'm now teaching journalism full-time at uh, this place called the Center for Collaborative Journalism at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. Uh, that's my primary gig. Um, however, I do additional work, uh, and one of those things is that I host a show, a podcast for Current, which we just discussed, uh, and that podcast is called The Pub. Here's my t-shirt, my official pub t-shirt, um, and it's a podcast uh, for the, about public media for the public media community. Um, it includes both commentary and interviews. Uh, I am someone who, I, opinion is part of the journalism that I do. My opinion on public broadcasting is part of the, the journalism that I do. I don't keep many of my opinions secret. Um, regarding my thoughts on the state of the public media business, um, I think in many respects it's more vibrant now than it's ever been. And I think in many respects, it's moribund. Um, it's a big, complex system, and there's parts of it where I see lots and lots of wonderful work happening, and there's parts of it where I see, uh, you know, uh, I just see wasteland. Um, and I have lots of concerns about the future, and I have lots of hope about the future. Um, I will tell you that I, in terms of my own work and my own writing, I have been both I have been accused of being a shill for the public media business, and I have been accused of being a gadfly uh, on the public media business. So uh, maybe both are right, maybe neither are right. Um, if, if Mike, when Mike's going to introduce himself shortly, if he's primar primarily coming at this from the standpoint of a critic, um, I may end up just adopting a posture here in this conversation that's a little bit more of uh, defending public media. But uh, please bear in mind that I have been known also as a withering critic of many. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. Mike, let me let me introduce People Mike then. Who, uh, yeah. Wish wish I would die. Yeah. Well, uh, let me introduce Mike. He's on the right. I came across an article he had written a few years ago on another fellow's blog uh, called uh, "Why I Watch But Don't Contribute uh, to PBS." So I do take it that Mike has has a, a less sanguine opinion. Mike, if you could give a little background first about yourself. Uh, where you come from, uh, what you write about, uh, uh, any websites you write for, and then uh, your opinions on public broadcasting. Hi. Um, I'm a retired psychotherapist, social worker, um, social service executive. I've created and run many social service programs. I've done just about everything in the field. But uh, I retired due to illness from years ago. And what I've been doing is sort of an advocation is I've been writing for various blogs. Uh, the first one that I wrote for, which uh, Adam connected with, was Jonathan Turley's blog. And Turley has the number one legal blog in the United States. How I got inter inter interested in that, it's another story. I'm not a lawyer, but I've always been interested in civil liberties. Um, what Adam first saw was a piece that I had written for Turley, I think, back in 11 or 212, which was titled PBS, Why I Watch the Don't Contribute. I wrote a second one as a follow-up a year later called PBS, Why I Watch the Don't Contribute Part 2. Okay. Uh, I opened up that piece basically explaining that at age 17, my father and I had sat watching the initial PBS broadcast introduced by Edward R. Murrow, who's one of the great, great names in broadcasting, probably the greatest as far as news broadcasting. And it was almost, I'm an emotional person, it was almost listening to it in tears, because television had 
been said to me by uh, John F. Kennedy, the head of the FCC, is a vast wasteland. And I saw it as such. And my father and I, I guess, was somewhat more intellectual. And we were yearning for something that would actually meet the bill. And what Murrow introduced to that initial you know, program was that this was going to be a non-commercial uh, expression of the arts, expression of education, expression of various things. I've seen through the years PBS become more and more of a commercial enterprise. I've seen the influence of basically the corporate state upon it. And I've also seen it turn right. Now, I know that uh, Dan asked that this not be a political conversation, and I'm not going to make it such. But what I would point out is that uh, part of that right would turn was when William F. Buckley came on with Firing Line, which I believe was 1971. At the time he came on, it was a very balanced thing. It was great to have him because there was also David Susskind on, there was Dick Cabot, there was a whole range of views. As it turned out, they fell by the wayside, and Buckley became the number one talk show, and I think still in PBS history. Uh, so that's basically where I'm coming from with all this. We can get into the specifics further on. Well, uh, I'm going to have, I want to divide the two next segments after this one, one focusing on public television, PBS, the television part, and then also on NPR. But just with recording this now in 2016, and I just want to uh, spend the, the next few minutes before ending this thing, just talking a little bit about the American idea of public television, because in Britain, uh, in most of Europe, in Australia, in Canada, uh, most television, as far as I know, is funded by the state. It's not commercial. So the U.S., in a sense, is almost an outlier amongst other nations in that from the very beginning, it was corporate sponsors that were sponsoring most of the television before the pub, uh, before the advent of public broadcasting. Uh, maybe, Adam, I'll start with you since you seem to uh, have a little bit more of a historian's take on this. Um, is the U.S. an outlier? And how does public broadcasting in the U.S. differ from, say, Australia, Canada, uh, and the rest of Europe? Sure. Um, yeah, the United States is absolutely an outlier among its peer nations, among developed Western democracies. Um, the way that we developed our entire broadcasting system is very different. Every country started with the same problem, which is that in order to do broadcasting, you have to reserve some chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum for that station. Mm -hmm. And that chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum belonged to no one and to everyone, right? And so the government has to be involved in some way. Um, and nations like Britain and Canada and Australia decided, okay, well, if we need to deal with this common resource, which is the electromagnetic spectrum, let's let's run it like, let's run broadcasting organizations as public utilities, essentially. Um, and in the United States, uh, the way that we thought about that is we thought, okay, well, we've got this chunk of spectrum. It's a, it's a basically a natural resource of our country. Um, the way that we will deal with that fact is that we will, we will give uh, chunks of it away to private companies. However, we will obligate those private companies to do certain things that are in the service of the public good. Um, and where we see that today, still, uh, the evening nightly news broadcasts on ABC, NBC, and CBS, those are, those are byproducts of that system, um, although they are, in fact, themselves profitable at this point. I don't know if they were in the beginning. Um, that was one of the many obligations that was put on to uh, commercial broadcasters because they were fundamentally using a natural resource that was available to all of us. Um, I think that uh, at what we see around the birth of public broadcasting, which was 50 years ago next year, so this is an opportune moment for us to be talking about it, um, is uh, everyone realized the problems in that system. The television was kind of garbage. and. Uh, and maybe they were doing decent news broadcasts, but it was a relatively small part of the programming day. And it certainly wasn't stuff that was uh, 
that was serving children, and that was one of the biggest things that really motivated the formation of public broadcasting was the fact that there was commercial TV was doing some smart programming for adults, but nothing for, for kids. Um, that was one of the things that if you look at the, the founding documents, the Carnegie Commission report, um, the act itself, the Public Broadcasting Act itself, uh, President Johnson's signing statement on the act, uh, the mission statements for PBS and for later NPR, uh, you know, programming for children is a very big part of what they were concerned about. Um, I suppose uh, another big difference between what we do in terms of public broadcasting in the United States and what our peer nations do is that we only partially fund our public broadcasting system in the United States via tax dollars. Um, it was a certainly a larger portion of the funding when the system first began, but it was never really intended to fully fund uh, the system. It was uh, it was supplementary funding, um, and as we have seen over the years, that public funding of public broadcasting has not kept pace with the growth of expenses, with simply inflation, um, and public broadcasters have been left to make up the difference however well they could, and they have turned to a number of sources, um, some of which have maybe been more corrupting than others, and we can talk about that, but as it stands now, you know, public broadcasting basically sits on a three-legged stool. One leg is taxpayer dollars, the other leg and other leg is corporate money, corporate underwriting, uh, and a third le the third leg is donations of various kinds. Donations ranging from small time individual donations, the things that we call membership, uh, all the way up to major gifts and philanthropy. And it is that mixture of funding that results in the system that we have today. And you know, we'll get into this. I, I think that having a diversity of funding has made the system stronger in some respects and weaker in others. Okay. Mike, do you have any comment? Yeah. I understand that, and it's a very good uh, summary of the difference in U.S. public broadcasting as opposed to around the world. I understand why we're doing it. We're a capitalist country. Obviously, there's a different perspective than in other countries in the world. The problem that I see with it and what bothers me so much isn't even the commercialization. It's the commercialization that begins to affect the product, to affect what is being produced. You take programs, and I there's, there's some that I love. I love American Master. I love um, a lot of the programs that deal with history. I love Ken Burns. But you take even American Master. They did one on, on John D. Rockefeller. History tells us that John D. Rockefeller was responsible in the Colorado mine strike, I think it was 1917, for the murder of about 114 people. This was done through thugs hired by him, the Pinkerton Detective Agency. So now I watched the American Master version of John D. Rockefeller. And what basically came across is, oh yes, you know, it was uh, you know, a bit of unfortunate stuff, and yeah, it was really terrible for the miners. But guess what? John D. Rockefeller Jr. came out, made a deal with them, broke the back of the union, and gave them a pay raise. And then it goes on. Well, this is one of the most terrible instances of labor violence in this country's history. Why, why did this happen? This happened because the Rockefeller Foundation is a great donor to PBS. This happened because the Rockefeller family and all of their interests are very important in the perspective of American capitalism. And so what occurs is that, uh, how do we put it, um, the producers of these various programs hold back actually producing and making, um, making an effort to really present history as it is. And it isn't that I'm naive, and I do understand that that occurs. Um, the problem with it is that, and PBS has become, for many of us, many of us more college educated, graduate school educated, it's become the place of record. And I'm an old guy, so I've lived through a lot more history than most people watching. And they'll watch that and come away with, oh, okay, this is a wonderful thing. Rather than coming away with some real understanding of the context, and this is what I think PBS loses. It loses the context because the context regarding certain aspects of the American corporate system are basically skipped over, not to offend 
inside us that you're confirming that to us. But let's get back to the other part of the yes. problem that I see. And what I write about, um, I am obviously a very left-wing person, but I understand that uh, I'm not, uh, how, how do I put it? I'm not uh, autocratic in my belief, but a left-wing belief. I see the left wing is also has a lot of problems. Um, what I see occurring in this country, and this goes from the broadcast media, the uh, television media in general, I see this country as being a wash of propaganda. Okay, and the co- propaganda that we see is of two nature. One nature, um, it's part of the military industrial complex, if I could say that. Um, and the other part of it is the corporate complex. And I understand, look, if I ran a corporation, I would be putting out prop- propaganda as well. Um, I don't put that down necessarily. I think what I look for and what I wanted from PBS is an antidote to that. Somebody that comes down some area that comes down in the middle, because as you talked about in the Coke in the Coke documentary, um, people on the left can be just as uh, dogmatic, just as uh, unseeing of the whole picture as people on the right. Um, I didn't mention, but I I do write a blog, and the blog that I write for Development Tale uh, basically deals with politics, but from the mythology. Of this gets into, you know, the reason I mentioned mythology is what we see coming through to us via our TV screen is a whole lot of mythology. Um, and what we what we discover with them is that when we look to something like PBS, which, let's face it, um, as a, the elite, the, uh, the literati, the intellectuals of the country, those are the people who really watch PBS. Okay, uh, that's who that broadcast is to. And basically, what we would hope is that they're at least getting a clearer picture of what's existing in the country on all sides. I don't think that that's happening. And I don't think it's happening because of the influence of corporate dollars, because of the influence of corporate dollars. Um, I think that what it's doing is it's not supplying what the original purpose was, at least as far as I heard from Edward R. Murrow in 1962, which, remember, was for NEP, not for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that, as you said, came on much later. I don't think that they're doing this for us. And it annoys me. It angers me because I see um, I see a country in decline. And I see it in decline because basically our politics no longer reflects, uh, how do I put it, our better nature. Well, and Mike, Mike let's, uh, let's wrap this segment up because I want to focus uh, the next segment on PBS and then NPR. Uh, and I want to I talk uh, a little bit more about the individual shows or things that may be influenced by politics, but my concern is the decline in quality of, uh, of public broadcasting. So I want to focus on that in the next segment. So we'll do that in a moment. See on the broadcast in a minute or two, and then I'll uh, uh, ask for you guys to jump in. So if you're ready, one, two, three, recording. Well, in this segment, I want to focus on the television side first, public broadcasting systems here in America. And the reason I wanted to do the show was my basic thesis is that public broadcasting was once glorious in my youth of the 60s, 70s, early 80s, but it's become sort of like cable light, L-I-T-E now, in terms of a lot of its broadcasting, irregardless, if that's a word, of uh uh, the political content. Um, I actually did a show last year with three television critics where I argued that television's golden age was from about 1960 to 80. It wasn't the classic golden age of the 40s and 50s when television was in its infancy. And I certainly don't think the melodramatic crap that I've seen on cable television, the HBO and these other shows that are basically just uh, uh, porno light uh 
uh, uh, is great television. So I, I always found it interesting that people, uh, that the Newt Minow comment about the vast wasteland uh, happened really when I think television went into its golden age. But regarding public television, I grew up and I remember, I think it was Kenneth Clark's Civilization. I remember Jacob Bronowski's The Scent of Man, uh, Cosmos by... Uh, by uh, uh, Carl Sagan. I remember the great television shows, uh, uh, the first few decade or so of, uh, of uh, Sesame Street, The Electric Company that had Morgan Freeman and Rita Moreno uh, on it on occasions. Zoom, 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 zoom. I remember uh, William F. Buckley's firing line. I love the debates that he had when he'd have a panel of five or six people on the left and the right talking. Uh, I remember all of these uh, great shows. And I remember the Anne of Green Gable miniseries uh, that came and some of the real quality stuff, uh, uh, I, Claudius, uh, and uh, that stuff, upstairs, downstairs in the 70s. Um, but in the last 25, 30 years, my premise is, or my idea is that uh, we've become sort of cable light. Uh, and I think it started sometime in the 80s when we got a lot of these uh, cooking shows, a lot of these uh, home improvement shows, uh, and most most noxiously, in my opinion, is the new age kind of crap with, that you get, the programming that you get on these pledge drives. People like a Wayne Dyer, or a Deepak Chopra, or a Suze Orman, and these, how can you have Nature and Nova and these shows uh, that are great about science and have someone like a Deepak Chopra or a Wayne Dyer with this new age pablum, to me, I found that I find that so sickening. So let me just throw that out there. Do you, Dan, do you want to know why? Do you want to know why they yeah. do that stuff? During yeah, go ahead. Drive? Go. Because you guys, and when I say you guys, I mean older folks, baby boomers, you like it. You watch it. I don't know what your problem is. Don't watch that crap. <laughs> I mean, this is so much of what you... So much of what you see in public television and to a certain extent public radio, but certainly what you see during the pledge drives on television is super reflective of the fact that public media has had one demographic, really its entire history. It has been a service for baby boomers primarily. And as you guys have aged, so has the you know, so has the, the, the tenor of the programming that is aimed at you. And I am I mean, I don't do not guys do not expect to have a uh, need to mount much of a defense of, of public television in this segment. I really hate everything that you've just said that you hate too, Dan. And I think that what they put on during Pledge Drive is absolutely awful, and it makes me so angry. I will say that there are some stations that are have been experimenting in the last year with doing what is called, um, what do they call it, uh, uh, mission pledging, or it's the idea is basically pledge around your actual shows, the ones that you're actually proud of, like Nova and Frontline, um, rather than trying to pitch to pledge drive around these special pledge drive shows that are just such garbage. And I'll be interested to see where that. I'll be interested to see what the the results are of those pledge drives. But um, yeah, I'm right with you, Dan. I mean, I think that stuff is garbage. I think that probably. Oh, I should go ahead and let Micah weigh in. Well, I, I, I'm really appreciating your comment. I'm, look, I live in South Florida. I live in the fastest growing Jewish community in the United States. Okay? One of the interesting things, our station down here is WXEL from Palm Beach. Um, around Pledge Drive, you see this plethora of programs like Jewish history, the, the, uh, the eye of the Jews, you know, whatever. It's like, and you know what they're doing. They're pandering to their audience. And I understand that, okay? And I got to admit, as an older guy in his 70s, uh, some of that resonates with me. But let's go back to what Dan had to say, because uh, he remembers PBS the way I remember PBS. When I was young, I saw um, PBS production of Rashomon, the great Japanese movie. They did a re. They didn't put the movie on. Well, they used to. They used to actually show a lot of Japanese films, a lot of the Akira Kurosawa films, yeah. which is just wonderful stuff. Some of the greatest things in film. They used to show that regularly. But here, they they actually put on. They the actor was Ricardo Montalban. They did Rashomon, a beautifully beautifully done pr production. It was especially good because even though living in New York, I never had a, a lot of money. And I couldn't get to Brooklyn. I saw um, the um, I saw the 
flag, I saw a, a bounty of really top-rate intellectual programming. And that has pretty much devolved at this point into what are they doing lately on the BBC? And I'll be honest with you, you know, I love upstairs, downstairs in the yeah. 70s. Uh, I'm not too sure that I love the current iteration of it that's won all, gone at all these wonderful awards. Yeah, the Britcoms, too. It's like anything British gets on as though it's somehow better than the crap that we've got on here. But what's interesting is the really great Britcoms actually were being broadcast in the 60s. They were redoing them. Yeah. Uh, and you had Terry Thomas, you had Peter Sellers, um, you had Spike Billigan. Monty Python, baby. Monty Python. Brilliant stuff. Monty Python. How can you yeah. forget? That was more towards the 70s, but that was brilliant stuff. Today, you don't see the quality of that. You also see, and this gets back to my idea about the corporate funding. Why do we see this old house out, which is basically a gentrification program? That's yeah. what it's all about. Uh, why do we see uh, these gardening shows? Why do we see a lot of it? Well, yes, there are viewers that like it, but also to products that are being sold. Right. What, what I found most interesting, and I forget the guy's name, but the guy who was the original um, MC of this old house, he Bob Vila. Um, Bob Vila. Bob Vila. Yeah. They got rid of him because they felt that he was doing too many commercial things on the side. Yeah. Well, if you look at, and I, I only occasionally look into this old house now, it's totally a commercial, um, in terms of product placement, a commercial enterprise. Um, you, you see this, that's part of the, the corporate influence. But what we don't get, we don't get, and I understand there's cost involved, we don't get original programming, we don't get original drama, and uh, we do get a lot of people like Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra. Uh, I'm a little more new age than, than perhaps Dan is, but I find that very hard to take. I find a lot of those programs, they've, they've got some guy, a psychologist coming on. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm trained in this. I've practiced for years. I ran training instances. And this guy comes on with this carbonated psychology pop crap. And they've got two hours of this guy coming on. And people are people are looking at it because people are people are hungry to find meaning in their lives. And that's just happens to be the way it is. What I find it disturbing, I'm personally disturbing because I'm looking for something beyond. Sure. But I think we need to I do think it's important for us to remember why I mean I, I, I completely agree with everything you've said. I do think it's important for us to think a little bit more critically about why it is the way it is. I don't I think it's really too simple of an explanation to simply say it's corporate influence. Um, you, we have to remember the market changes that have occurred around public broadcasting over this time period, uh, the most significant of which was uh, the, the, the point in the 90s in which cable television became ubiquitous. That's really the moment, if I were to put a moment on its history, where the bottom fell out of public television. You know, you gentlemen are old enough, I'm not, to remember a time when televisions had a dial that went up to 13. There yeah. just weren't that many channels. And as a result... Um, uh, the audience was somewhat captive, and if your only options were the three major networks and PBS, PBS could put something on that was challenging, um, and people would watch it because they had nothing else to watch. That We just don't live in that world anymore. Um, right around the early 90s, that world just disappeared, and PBS started having to think a little bit more hard about what it was due, about not what PBS is an oversimplification. Uh, what public television stations started having to do was to think a little bit harder about ratings and what they were putting on and what people actually wanted to watch and what people actually didn't, didn't actually want to watch. Because at the very least, you need enough people to... Adam, if you can continue, we just lost you. Sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, following the... Uh, Following cable television becoming ubiquitous, uh, public television had to start to fight a little bit more for ratings. Um, and they needed ratings, A, to make their business model, keep their business model sustainable, and B, um, you know, you got to ask yourself, if nobody's watching, are you offering a service? 
you can't serve anybody if you don't have their attention. Um, cable television also really cut into what had become really core areas of strength for public television. I know that, Dan, you talked about rather dismissively the cooking shows. I mean, I think that Julia Child is one of the best things that's ever been on television. Oh, well, yeah, she was entertaining, but you don't need 40. Now, my point is, she was she no, was no. funny, and but you don't need 40. You know, you don't, every, well, I, every ethnic cuisine has its own show now. Sure, I understand. But what happened was, was that, you know, back, back when you guys were young, Julia was the only cooking show, pretty much, you know. Now, you've got the Food Network. You've got all of post-cable post, post cable television era. Um, there were all of these things that started to compete with these core areas of strength for public television and are really, really hurt the business. And I know we don't like to think about it as a business, but it's going to be a business unless and until the American public chooses to actually fund public broadcasting in, uh, to, uh, uh, in, in a much more substantial way than it historically has. Um, so... And then uh, Mike mentioned a bunch of things, things that are to me very troubling, which is all of what we could call sponsored content, um, shows that are essentially advertised and advertisements for other things that the producers do, um, and that ranges from things like this old house where they are doing product placements for, um, uh, you know, the, whatever drywall they're installing that week to uh, things that are a little bit more innocuous, but I think still troubling, like Rick Steves, if you guys ever watch Rick yeah. Steves' travel shows. And I think Rick is a wonderful guy. Um, he's a really idealistic person, and his values really permeate his show. On the other hand, if, you know, I, I did an episode of The Pub where I interviewed him about his business model, and he comes out and tells you that he, he does not charge stations to air his show. He, give, he makes his show for public television for free because it's essentially a big advertisement yeah. for his travel books. And same does. thing with like P. Allen Smith, you know, right, uh, yeah. go, for Gardner. Yeah, and, 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 and that shows you that, I mean, and I think Rick is like, Rick is sort of the poster boy for that system because I think he, he doesn't exploit that. I think he makes a show that is very smart and very affirming um, of his values. Um, but he's sort of the benevolent dictator in the room. There are less benevolent dictators there. And all that stuff troubles me enormously. Um, you mentioned, Mike, that we don't get original drama anymore. We just get stuff that they buy from the BBC. And again, there's a reason for that, which is that the BBC has, has the money to produce those shows, and public television in the United States just doesn't. Um, PBS did, um, just this year, uh, fund the development of a new piece of American original drama called Mercy Street, which was a, a Civil War medical drama mm. um, that I, I talked about and reviewed, and I just thought it wasn't very good, but I, I appreciated the attempt. Mm. On the other hand, I saw that it was this unbelievable expenditure of resources for just six little episodes of yeah. television, and it's really the exception that proves the rule. They just don't have the money. They just don't have the money. Well, Adam, so, Adam, let me, yeah. if I could just jump in here, let me, because my major concern is more in sort of the aesthetic, artistic uh, decline of both the uh, uh, PBS and NPR. And let me just uh, ask you this, because you brought up a good point, and that is that PBS used to be sort of counter-programming to the networks. Since we have, like you mentioned, all these uh, these uh, cooking shows and the home improvement shows and the travel shows, since there are now these cable networks, why doesn't PBS say, hey, we've got to stand out and do counter-programming? To me, one of the best things that they could do is Go back to the 40s and 50s and do a Playhouse 90 kind of thing. Get some young guy. I mean, Broadway is is a piece of shit that's corporatized too now. You know, you know, uh, The Adventures of Cinderella, the musical or something. Let's get some real young guys who are the future August Wilsons and the Rod Serlings and the Patty Shayevskys and, and the Arthur Millers of the 21st century say, here, we're going to do 10 shows a year of, and you know, one, one a month yeah, even. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Are you going to pay for it? Yeah, I, mean, I would, and I think I, I think a lot of people would, and I think you would get maybe. maybe listen, Dan, maybe maybe you would. Um, that that has not been public television's experience in the last couple of decades when they've tried to do really challenging, expensive, aesthetically challenging, uh, expensive programming. That like people like you have come out of the woodwork to fund it. That has not really been their experience. I will also tell you that you know when you talk to the leaders of local public television stations and you talk about all of this junk that they have on during the day, and they will in their in their you know, at least confidentially admit that a lot of it is junk. What they say is, listen, I'm putting that crap on the air so that I can try to subsidize the stuff that I do care about, which is the, above all else, the children's programming, 
you got to rec- you got to recognize that um, you know it's it's still the case that public television is the only place where there is uh, programming for children that is really designed with uh, the neurology of learning in mind, where they're doing things to affirm really positive values. It's it's very very important, especially in poor communities where kids don't have access to all of the other things that are out there. All they have is what's on the television. So there's that, and then there's the news programming stuff like Frontline that's really really valuable, that's incredibly expensive. What these what these general managers will tell you is, listen, I air crap so that I can try to keep the good stuff running, and you know it's hard to argue with that. Two points. One, um, a little bit on the negative side, uh, but that's not the biggest point. Part of the problem with the news programming is take um, PBS NewsHour. 70% of that is paid for by the Liberty News Network, which is a right wing, which is owned by a right wing billionaire. 70% of it? 70%. Uh, I could. I could pull out documentation that I've got on it, but that, that's the truth. Check it out. But let's get to more, um, the more important issue you raised, which I think is great, Adam. Um, pretty much we, we've shown our, our disagreements, and we've also shown where we agree. Here's the problem. Most of my viewing now is via Roku. I've got Amazon Prime, I've got Netflix, I've got Hulu, I've got all of these things. I, I, I also have HBO. I rarely watch network TV um, because simply that there's just so much available for me that I don't have to. The question is this. We know that the various PBS stations have very valuable spots on the TV dial as far as commercial value goes. Where does PBS go? How does it, and I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. How does it compete in this new paradigm of television? Whereas I know both, I've got two daughters in their 30s. Both of them don't watch network TV. They just basically pick and choose among, and that's, that's where TV is going. And that's where the whole, you know, that whole media thing. Where, where the where the goes to be PBS? Where where is this going to be? Can it even compete? Can it continue to exist? I don't think it will. I think I think that uh, the system as we know it um, is on a is on its last legs. Um, now I I've, I've gotten into trouble putting a date on it <laughs> because it's it's proven to ha- have more longevity than I would have thought. But it's not headed to a good place because fundamentally, what you're talking about, Mike, is all of us are consuming media in a way where we no longer go to a provider to give us stuff. We go looking at for the specific piece of content that we want. All right, uh, public television stations and the network that serves them. PBS, one of the networks. There's all, there's others like American Public. Uh, uh, television, APT, um, they are being disintermediary, right? And um, and that's good in the sense that in that new world, I or you, Mike, could support just the thing that we want. If we think that Frontline is valuable, we could just donate to Frontline without having to send our money to this station that is airing Deepak Chopra crap, you know? And that's a good thing. On the other hand, um, having a, a network kind of lord over all of this has allowed for um, a bunch of money to get sucked in and for it to be distributed unequally in a good way. For you know, crappy programs that draw a lot of audience to, in effect, subsidize really good programs that don't have a lot of audience or to generate a lot of money. That's what we're losing, and um, and I'm very concerned about where we go from that. But I mean, I'm going to be the last person to weep when the public television system dies. Uh, the the only thing that I feel it still does that's really really important is is do uh, educational programming for kids in poor in poor circumstances where they're really dependent on television. And that's what I want to pick up on. Uh, the last two points in, in this segment I want to talk about are children's programming and then arts program. Let me start with the children. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you thought that it was of high quality. And I'd mentioned uh, the Zooms and the electric companies and the uh, original version of Sesame Street. And I think Sesame Street is still pretty good. It's gotten better with the graphics. I still think that's probably the shining jewel in the crown. But I remember Fred Rogers and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and I saw this abomination that they have on called Daniel the Tiger's World. And Daniel the Tiger was a hand puppet on the original Mr. Rogers thing, and now he's a yeah. cartoon. 
And I, I wow. saw I saw a few months ago uh, uh, when I was off, I, I, I saw a handful of these uh, early morning cartoons. And I have to say, Mr. Rogers never spoke down to children. The original Sesame Street never spoke down to children. The Zoom, Zoom, Zoom kids from the 70s treated their children like intelligent beings. The cartoons that I see, to me, are a little better than... Uh, the abominations of the 1980s when you had uh, G.I. Joe and He-Man. Dan, I don't think you're being fair at all. I mean, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood is a really good program. I don't like it, neither do you, but we're not really the target audience, are we? Um, I feel really good about having my little boy watch Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. It's... uh, it's, Do you really think it's qualitatively in in a league with with its progenitor program? No, I don't. And I I, I think that Fred Rogers was a very special person and we will not see his like again. Um, and I know that lots of, you know, and look, I mean, I have a whole fun episode that, you know, we're talking about this, that you could, that you could listen to if you wanted to about the future of public television, but, uh, children's public television. But I mean, you know, it, it, things like, uh, uh, what is it? Kate plus cat. Uh, that's a really good show. I mean, these are things that are in full, they have, they have whole teams of educators and scientists and psychologists really, really vetting the curricular value of these programs, and they do, like, a pretty good job. And if you want to, I mean, maybe you don't like it, but you should turn on Nickelodeon and compare what you're see- what kids are getting through PBS to what they're seeing on Nickelodeon. It's a very important service. Yes, I, I have to agree with Adam on that. Um, I've got three grandchildren, 11, 7, and 5. Um, when I had them with me last summer for an extended period of time, we watched a lot of the program that they programming that they watch, and my daughter is very, uh, very watchful over them and the content of what they watch and pretty much what she allows us to watch of PBS because PBS program. And I sat with them, and while I can say on one hand it was a little slow for my taste. On the other hand, I was enchanted, and I watched their faces as they were listening to it. And I think a very important aspect that, that, that has to be looked at is the not talking down to children. Fred Rogers was wonderful. Uh, Sesame Street, in its beginning iteration, was wonderful in the fact that you said it, it approached children where they were. Um, I'm a little more, let's say, uh, distrustful of Sesame Street these days because there's been too much Sesame Street product that's been uh, commercialized within the market. And whenever I see that, I begin to worry how much content then gets into it. But the PBS children's programming, that is a wonderful thing. That's a very necessary thing. And it's very important in terms of uh, the children in this country, as Adam mentioned, who might be in less fortunate circumstances because their their parents aren't going to be able to give them Roku or these individual things. They're going to be limited to the broadcast network. And they need content, and they need content that, that uplifts them, that talks to them, and that doesn't just fill them with a bunch of roadrunner cartoonish violence. As much as I personally like it, but it, it isn't what I would have my children watch. Well, let me uh, just end this segment on uh, the television side, and I want to talk about arts programming. And I actually think NPR is worse when it comes to the arts and public broadcasting, the television side. Um, I think one of the things that I find the most noxious, and this is probably going to get under Mike's uh, burr a little bit, uh, probably the most noxious person I, I've seen on NPR is Bill Moyers. And it's not because of his political views and, and the shows he has, but when he's done these arts shows, um, he did a show on poetry, I remember, about 25 years ago that made me want to vomit. And I'm a poet, and uh, uh, most of the arts program generally focuses on politicized art. You're not going to find uh, shows on say, great musicians today uh, or great artists today, unless they subscribe to the left-wing political beliefs of people like Moyers. Uh, And these are people generally that don't understand the art that they are putting on, whether they're doing uh, whether they're doing uh, uh, documentaries like the Burns Brothers, who were great in their day, but have gotten quite formulaic in recent years. Uh, or whether it's someone like a Bill Moyers who knows absolutely nothing about what he's talking about when it comes to the arts, yet he'll go on and he'll make these shows or he'll 
these documented and talk about stuff that's utterly beyond him. So let me just throw that out. What do you think about the arts program, the documentaries, the Moyers, the Burns brothers, that kind of thing? Let's, let's, talk, about, let's talk about the, the issue you raised in terms of left, left wing art. Um, surprisingly, although I, I have to be considered a creature of the left wing, I'm very sanguine about the left wing as well as the type. Uh, part of that experience is I was involved in a very radical union maybe with the most radical unions in the country throughout the late 60s and early 70s. And I knew their friends went for drinks with, had were up over for dinner at. I knew a lot of people who were left-wingers in terms of communists, in terms of progressive Labour Party people, Maoists, Stalinists, you name it. I knew all of these people. And one of the things, even though I was a member of the movement on a minor scale, and even though we shared some of the same beliefs was I couldn't stand their particular intolerance. I couldn't stand the fact that they had a particular body line. And I think the problem that, that you bring up, Dan, is true about the arts in general in the United States. Yeah. Um, I think that we have to, you know, in one sense there are people who believe that all art is wrong. I think in a sense, though, that politicizing art um, actually does not do art the greatest service in the world. This does it tremendously. And, and also, too, when you're talking about art shows, I remember, I, I guess you might, the early days of PBS with somebody named John Nagy who had a show called Let's Draw with John Nagy. Yeah. Where it's basically some guy who is showing you the nuts and bolts of actually drawing painting of all of this. It was a fabulous show. It would cost absolutely nothing to put on a show like that today because it had very little production value. Yeah, but it's the it's the opportunity cost, Mike. You know, it's you're losing money by hemorrhaging uh, audience, which you would do if you put a show like on. You just well, well, Bob right. Ross is still put on today and, and gets decent ratings, doesn't he? I mean, he, he, Bob. I mean, not that Bob Ross was a great artistic show, but he 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 was even more dumbed down than than what uh, Mike is talking about. And now we have guys who are basically ill. There's a guy in who I th think is based out of Hawaii. I forget the name of, but I saw him. And he's even a worse artist than Bob Ross. And he's teaching people how to paint. Well, but, but this, this gets back to the question that I asked Adam before. And, and the, the real issue of with the go is this whole, this whole medium. Because, yeah, it, you know, it, there are production values. It costs money. It costs money to hire its staff. It costs money to produce these things. And there may or may not be an audience. And that being the case, um, while we would love to have art play a more vital role in terms of what's going on, practically, are we even going to find it there? And practically, where, where, where are we even going with if, as Adam believes, and I believe also, uh, the, the days are numbered of this, this type of uh, programming, the days are numbered of this type of network TV, um, this is really the sadness of it. You know, when you talk of a golden age, the problem with talking of golden ages is you're always talking in retrospect. Yeah. You're talking about the past. Um, the golden age is gone. Um, in a lot of ways, believe it or not, I believe we're in a golden age of video programming today. I agree. Which we will look back on possibly 10, 15 years from now, if I'm still around, and say, boy, was it great back then. Um, the problem is, we're dealing with a medium whose time, I think, is past. And as much as we'd like to remember, and as much nostalgia, and as much warmth, something like that gives me to remember to, to remember even especially sharing it with my father as I did so many years ago um, yeah it's very nice it's a nice memory but it really has no place in the world today and it's sad but you know sometimes things come to an end Adam do you have a final comment and then we'll move on to NPR in the next segment sure yeah um, yeah Dan I mean I, I think that uh, I mean I think 
think that the same market forces that I've been talking about this whole time apply to the arts programming, and that explains why the arts programming is the way that it is. I would also say that I think that a, a criticism that people in public television have been sincerely um, affected by is the idea that what they had been making in what you guys might consider to be the golden age of public television was an elitist product. It was something that was for... Um, the cultural and intellectual elite of the country, and that was who it appealed to. And a lot of people asked the question, well, you know, that this is not, this is not, that is not a demographic that needs a subsidized media product, you know? Um, if we're going to subsidize you with tax dollars, you should be making stuff that appeals to a wider range of people, um, and especially people that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, a politically loaded term, I mean, say people who are a little bit more down market. Um, and that, I think, has driven a lot of their programming decisions in terms of the arts programming that they do, try to do things that are a little bit more accessible, that are a little bit less elite. And I understand the logic behind it. But uh, well, let, me just add, let, me, let me just turn that around, though. Isn't it a bit elitist to say that, uh, you know, his, historical programming like American Experience, uh, uh, well, the American mass is uh, learning about the life of a Judy Garland or about, uh, um, you know, uh, any, any great artist, uh, Thomas uh, Andrew Wyeth or something that they've had on. Uh, to say that that doesn't, uh, that can't reach, say, uh, a, a young black uh, viewer in Philadelphia today, I, I, I don't buy that. I, I I, I don't. I don't it's think not, that Dan, Dan. Dan, it's not an issue of opinion. We have we have empirical data, and it's called ratings. We know what people watch, and we know what they don't watch. This is not some. This is not a matter of debate. Well, I find, what I find interesting is when I mention my father. My father dropped out of school in ninth grade. My father actually spent time in jail. He was a felon. Okay. My father also read, read Camus and Sartre in the 50s. My father had a pretty good intellect. My father uh, actually would take me to see what were called back then avant-garde movies. Okay, he, he was a fairly intellectual man, yet he was a car salesman. I mean, we were people of the lower middle class at best. Um, so I think in one sense, when we're talking about who we'll be appealing to, there is an elitist tenor to it. I think in another very important sense, a lot of current public PBS broadcasting is focused on appealing to the intellectual, the elite, the uh, upper middle class and upper class mentality. I mean, you look at the programming, it does speak of that. Um, it's sad, but I don't know how you how you overcome that in a way too, because truthfully, um, what you're talking about is talking about a devalued educational system in this country. You're talking about the fact that poor people simply don't get the same cultural advantages that rich people do. You're not talking about a lack of intelligence, not at all. What you're talking about is you're talking about a culture that puts a premium on people of the upper economic classes and caters to them. And when it comes to people of the great unwashed majority of us, it's like they basically talk down to us, they feed us, you know, when on network TV, 50% cop shows, they, they play this game so that people really growing up into this don't even understand that there is a difference. They don't get that there, there are other possibilities. Um, just one last thing, though, because it does go in the arts. I love theater. It doesn't take a hell of a lot, other than the commitment, to financially produce shows that don't require a great deal of background, don't require a great deal of a lot of other things. But then again, you get put, you get caught in the conundrum. Uh, do the programmers think that it's going to be watched? Will it indeed be watched? And finally, the last, the last thing is, if it's watched by X number of people, does X number of people translate into what the program is seen as success? And that becomes a, a, a very difficult question to answer. All right. And well, let's let, let's end it there, and uh, 
pick it up in our next segment and talk about uh, NPR since uh, that seems to be a little bit less dictated by ratings. And we'll do that in a moment. Well, we spent a bit of time talking about the television side of things. Now it's radio's turn. Uh, I've uh, I've never been a great de devotee of NPR. Usually when I've had jobs driving around, I've listened to it in lieu of listening to uh, <clears throat> the Rush Limbaugh type talk shows or the sp endless sports shows or the mindless top 40 stuff. Um, but I, I found that NPR in some ways has become sort of like uh, uh, a lot of the all- uh, news kind of stations. Uh, and I do think it does a better job of bringing coverage of things that happen in Africa or the third world or, uh, you know, uh, uh, behind the former Iron Curtain, uh, things that, uh, you know, you're not going to get on CBS, ABC or NBC. So I have no real problem with the reportage and the journalism aspect of it. Um, before I get into sort of my beefs about it, let me ask you both, do you have any uh, pros or con views on, say, the reportage and journalism aspects of uh, National Public Radio? Yeah, I do a lot of over-the-road driving because I have a house in, in upstate New York and I have, I'm down here in Florida and I tend to drive back and forth. And there I am for hours on the road with nothing to listen to on the radio. I don't, I'm not great at programming music. And what I do consistently is I go from area to area is I search out the your NPR station. And I'm fascinated by it because a lot of times they will discuss topics that um, I basically, if I, if I saw that on a listing, I wouldn't even bother to tune in. And yet, They'll get into it, and it'll be fascinating stuff that I didn't know. It will be informative. It will be educational. And I suppose, and this is something Adam knows far better than I, that a good reason for this is it's a very cheap medium. Um, it doesn't cost a lot to produce the radio show. And because of that, because cost isn't a factor, I would imagine that it allows them to be more creative. It also allows them, because uh, one of the things I notice as I, I drive to upstate New York back and forth, is there is a whole consortium of NPR stations, so that when they do the station announcement, there'll be 15 different stations from Albany, Woodstock, all of them. And it's like, but it's the same programming. I guess, you know, they... There's, there's certain local shows that come on. Um, this is really um, where the excitement can be in terms of media in the country. But, but the problem is, which Adam can fill us in on more, I don't know about the demographics of radio audience or how many people are actually tuning in. And remember, they're, being, uh, they're going up against... Um, various in-car radio networks and the, the, the paid the subscription radio networks. So I, where does that go? Where does that yeah. go in? Because that is probably one of the most creative aspects of media in America today. Yeah, public radio is really, um, it continued to grow and get more and more vibrant. And it's really just now where we look at the the, the overall big picture ratings numbers, the, the audience numbers, we're now starting to see a bit of a decline. Um, there was a, 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 a Nielsen graphic uh, looking at NPR's Morning Edition ratings uh, nationally that got a lot of attention a few months ago that showed that uh, they're starting to lose ground in all age brackets except 65 plus. And again, I think what that shows you is not necessarily that 65 plus people are listening more. It's that the baby boomers are aging into the 65 plus demographic and they have, again, always been the core audience. To answer your question, Dan, about um, how I think about the journalism, uh, um, I, you know, NPR has been in many ways, or public radio, uh, public radio has been in kind of the opposite position from the one I talked about with public television. They've thrived because they haven't had much competition for years and years and years in most cities. If you wanted radio that just wasn't total garbage, you had one choice. 
which was your public radio station. It was the only place where anything remotely intelligent was happening. And it was the only place where you didn't have 20 to 30 minutes of the hour being ads. You know, screaming ads like one eight seven seven cars for kids. That app that you get in a lot of cities, right? Um, it was your only option. If you had half a brain, you had one option on the radio, and it was your local NPR station. And that is now, for the first time in a long time, starting to slip. And as a result, people in public radio are having to think a little bit harder about their mission and what they are creating, um, because you know. Uh, if you talk about, again, Dan, you asked about journalism. I, I think NPR journalism is, is very good. I don't think that it's that different from what you get in other serious media. Um, and NPR, public radio, we didn't have to think too hard about that distinction because there was only, they had, they were providing a service which was doing decent journalism on the radio, and no one else was doing decent journalism on the radio. So they didn't have to think too hard about their mission. They just had to do decent journalism. Now, um, in the podcasting world, you know, and I don't listen to terrestrial radio at all anymore. I only stream or listen to podcasts. Um, I, I used this as an example on one of my shows recently. Um, there's, a, there's an excellent NPR podcast called NPR Politics. It's just, it's just a political show. It's really good. It's really smart. It's very popular. But is it that different from any of the other really excellent commercially funded politics podcasts that are out there? I would say no. I think that that is the case where we're seeing NPR duplicating a service that is already available in the commercial marketplace. Um, and I have, through my own reporting, really tried to focus public radio's attention on thinking harder about what it can do in terms of journalism that really isn't being done by other people. Because the old world in which they simply they just had to do competent journalism on the radio because they were the only ones doing it on the radio. That world is is going to start fading very rapidly. Well, let me uh, let me turn to again uh, the arts program. You know, uh, and I want to direct this at Adam first, and then get Mike to chime in. So just give me a minute or two to set up my premise. Um, you had uh, basically Adam said that it was money that was dictating things, and and Mike and you have now both agreed that uh, money is not as important in NPR. So I want to talk about some of both the national and local. I'm in Central Texas, and uh, last year I, I I want to give you about seven or eight examples of uh, uh, programming, both local and national, uh, where the focus was the arts, but it was so ridiculously bad that uh, I I can't excuse it. For example, there was a fellow, there was a whole hour spent that a guy named David Mitchell did uh, a novel about being autistic, uh, but it wasn't on the writing of the novel. It was about his life and focused on him, and it was a, a literary review supposedly put on, and it had nothing to do with the literature. Second example, uh, film reviews that I hear online, and the I, I, irony is you'll hear just the audio clips, and it's like, well... It makes absolutely no sense to do that, and it gave it, and the clips give no sense of what the person is talking about. About since the the video is missing. Another thing, and I could go on for about Garrison Keillor forever. I think he's sort of the Bill Moyers of National Public Public Radio, but he he well, had gone, so you don't have to talk about him. Yeah, anymore. yeah. So, but he did. He he does this daily little bit where he talks about the the writer of the day or something. That's just just atrocious. Then. There was a whole hour devoted to John Stewart's wife named Tracy, who did some book uh, on animals, and this was just because this was just a celebrity fluff piece devoting her. There was a, a, a supposed piece done on a poet named Humble the Poet, the, this spoken word guy who just did nothing but profanity and whatnot. And anyone who knows poetry knows that spoken word is to poetry what pornography is to actual cinema. And they, they devoted this on him just because he was black, or maybe he wasn't even black. I think he was some other m minority uh, ethnic. Then they had an erotica writer. They I, I'm not going to, Dan, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to participate if you're going to say things like that. That they had a poet on just because he was black. That's... That's really beyond the pale. I can't get, I can't talk to you if you're going to talk like that. Well, I mean, it, but it's true. They, they had this woman who no, was writing. Sure. They had this woman who was writing erotica. Who, for example, was a, an executive at a Fortune 500 company, and all the books that they review are being put out by mainstream presses. Nothing for independent presses. Nothing for eBooks, and nothing uh, for people who self-publish. And in this day and age, 
Most of the stuff that's actually good, you will find more good quality stuff coming from self-publishers and, and ebook publishers publishing on Amazon than you will from the publishing houses. So if, if money is not the, the option, or is, is not as big uh, as not as big a thing as uh, it is in, in on the television side, why are they doing nothing but but putting out ad executives, celebrity bios, and reviewing this as if this is artistically important? But my but Mike, my point is, someone like John Stewart's wife can go on the the View or uh, the Talk or all these bubble headed talk shows where people just talk around. They don't. Th this should not be being reviewed on a public medium here as though it's some great work of art. And oh, uh, Dan. Okay, Dan. You're, so we need to we need to. You're talking about two different things, and let's let's disaggregate them. One, you're talking about why does public radio um, cover uh, works of art that are that are very popular that are coming from uh, uh, that are coming from big corporations and are selling a million units. Why is NPR giving those attention when, in fact, you know, people are going to hear about them anyway? They don't need to hear about them through NPR. You're talking about that, and then you're thinking about then you're also talking about why is it why is public radio talking about art that you, Dan, don't think is meritorious? Let's talk about topic number one. Topic number one: Why should NPR deal with popular culture? Because, especially on the news side, if you're talking about a news program like Morning Edition or All Things Considered, or Fresh Air even, um, they have a responsibility to cover the culture as it is, not as you want it to be, not even as they want it to be. And whether you think that Beyonce is good or not, Beyonce is a culturally ascendant force. She's incredibly important. And, and when she drops an album, as she did last week, it's a very important cultural moment for the country. And so it's their job as a news program to talk about it and deal with it as news and also to engage with it on a critical level. And, and not just engage it with it as a work of art, but also engage it in the broader cultural context for it. You know, you talked earlier, Dan, about how you didn't like how someone was, uh, how a book author was being interviewed about um, about autism versus about the book about autism. Well, I, as a show, as a former show producer, I will tell you that I tended to find that if we could bring on uh, authors who could talk about an issue that is raised by their work, that tended to just make for better radio than talking about the work on its own intrinsic merits, which is really inaccessible radio for an audience that hasn't read the book yet. Um, so that's that's thing number one. Thing number two: Why is public radio giving attention to art that you damn think is meritorious? I deal with this and see this all the time. And again, I think this comes back to the fact that you guys, baby boomers, um, you are used to 
I'm sorry, I'm, I shouldn't be saying this so derisively, but I like, I like both of you, but your generation is used to having everything cater to your sensibilities, right? Because you have been the dominant commercial force for so, so long. And now what you have is, you know, younger people working as producers in a place like NPR, trying to bring in art that speaks to their sensibilities, or, and you guys don't like it. Well, too bad. It's not for you, but, you know, I don't think that you should want to live in a world in which people are only catering to your sensibilities. It's not about, it's not about catering to sensibilities. It's about y your argument about the television side was this was a money issue. If money is not the issue in NPR, there should be a focus on the art. And for example, again, a John Stewart's wife's book about animals, and I think it was, you know, uh, some, some fluff book about animals, how to groom your pets or some crap. I mean, this is why you have the Howard Stearns of the world. Or, you know, you could, she could go on to Howard Stearns and you talk about she, her bra size. You going to have Tracy McShane on? You really think that that's going to happen? No, she's not. They're not. No, look, you can... Now, I heard that episode. I think it was Fresh Air. Um, I agree with you, Dan. I didn't think that it was that good. Um, I, I And I do think that probably, although Tracy McShane is, is a person who has... Uh, uh, fame and relevance in her own right. I do think that probably the main reason she got on that booking was because she's John Stewart's wife. I don't think it has anything to do with money per se. Uh, and again, I also, I mean, as as Mike was saying, look, you're going to have some hits and misses. I would agree that that was a bit of a miss, but you can't judge the whole system by that one thing. Well, I, what, hold, hold on, Mike. Let, let me let me just let me just respond to one thing to, to Adam first, and then I'll let you go, Mike. Um, I have nothing wrong with uh, reviewing Beyonce's album or when Prince died last week, you know, to, to have uh, retrospectives on Prince. But I'll give you I'll give you an example. And I, I don't know, may, maybe maybe the Central Texas and NPR is an outlier, but I tend to doubt it since they also have uh, national and international programming. There was an hour spent. I remember listening. Um, apparently, there was an Australian vlogger with a V, not a blogger, but a vlogger named uh, Asina O'Neill, who quit her, her vlog for, for some, some reason she was being harassed by Australian law. And an hour was spent on this minor Australian celebrity, online celebrities gossip, as if it was some cultural minor event. To you. What? Well, yeah. Minor to you. Um, maybe major to other people. Also, it wasn't just about her and her gossip. That was about this entire extraordinarily important and culturally influential phenomenon of cyberbullying that maybe you don't really encounter it but young people in this country really do it's a major issue and you're not and, and there, there wasn't there's not an australian artist in australia a great painter that could get that that uh, that hour could have been more usefully spent on go ahead mike let, let me jump in for a i'm 71 years old i'm an old boy okay and i would have loved to have heard john John Stewart is a cultural icon. John Stewart probably is the most respected newsman in this country, and he's not a newsman. This is something that's very important, and, and really, Adam, I appreciated what you said about my generation. I'm a, I'm a couple of years beyond yeah, a couple of, yeah. And actually, I'm Generation X, so... Thank you. 
using art from that perspective because they do have a different sensibility, and but it's a sensibility that you might profit from tapping in on. Well, the sensibility is not the issue. You can go online. This is what Google is for. This is what all of these online you can find. And anything you want to know about, I, I just did a, a show on unexplained phenomenon and the Slender Man mythos. You know that those two girls who uh, attacked another girl uh, a, a year or two ago because of the Slender Man mythos. You can find that all online. My point is when you when you have a public uh, television or public radio, there is a certain public trust, and and in in doing so, you ha you should be focusing on some of the better and more interesting aspects, not. Not Australian vloggers, not John Stewart's wife, and I would agree, John Stewart. Okay, he was on what fifteen, twenty years, and so he has he has that Beyonce like thing that you could say he's cultural cachet. His wife I'd never heard of before, so you know I I I think that the, the connection to Stewart is the point. Aren't those really value judgments on your part? Yes, and there's nothing wrong with value judgments. I, you, if you're valuing good art over bad art or good journalism over bad journalism, that's a good thing. But your good art or your bad art is somebody else's reverse. Yeah. I, and we can talk about objectivity and subjectivity, and I talk about it, that all the time in the arts. But doing but, the end programming, okay, they're making their value judgments also. And as, as far as, and you brought it up, so I'll, I'll just go with it. As far as hearing from John Stewart's wife, I would have been very interested in that because I'm interested in John Stewart and I'd like to know who he's married to. Okay. Now, maybe that's uh, a bit of celebrity watching on my part. Well, I admit to it. Um, this is this is what comes about. How do, you can't really you can't program to satisfy everybody. Well, let me let me just ask about the internet too because the. The PBS especially has gotten into the internet in the last few years. They have science shows, science hosts. A lot of, uh, a lot of, if you go on, you know, there are things like, they're called Crash Course is one of YouTube channel. There's a, a, a YouTube channel, uh, uh, oh, the, the name's, but there are a lot of these sort of educational, Vsauce kind of channels. And now PBS has started putting out, it seems like they have, must have 50 YouTube channels and whatnot. Where does the money for that come from? And since that is very much replicating these commercial uh, sources like the Vsauce and, and the crash courses, uh, isn't, isn't then, couldn't the resources PBS or, uh, is putting towards these online efforts be better used on the actual television side? Since uh, I'm just wrapping up here since we talked of NPR. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen these uh, online educational channels, Adam? Sure, yeah. Um, you're saying that you would prefer for public broadcasting to just focus on terrestrial broadcasting and therefore consign what? themselves to oblivion? Well, no, because what you have said is that they they are replicating in on yes, uh, on I, television so, so a lot I, of stuff that's I elsewhere. That they need to, so yes, I think that people like like NPR um, need to think harder about what they're doing in terms of their digital offerings and to think harder about how to offer a service that is not going to come out of the commercial marketplace. Um, and I think that that's a legitimate criticism of theirs. Um, however, you know, to say that they just shouldn't be doing anything digital is insane. I mean, people are people are going to stop listening to terrestrial radio. Uh, not, not. I, I think that probably terrestrial radio will hang around forever to some degree, but it's going to be a tiny rump of what it is now. Um, you know, I'm an old guy. I'm 34, and uh, and I don't listen to terrestrial to terrestrial radio at all. And I work at. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not saying they 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 they, they need to to ignore that, but. If you have people like the guy who who, who founded Vsauce is what you know a YouTube celebrity. Uh, same thing with the bro the two brothers who do Crash Course. Why are they replicating the basically the same content, the science and history content that these channels do well as commercial enterprises? And why not? Why doesn't PBS say, well, we're not going to do Vsauce PBS version. Let's do uh, let's do something else that's totally different uh, that we can't do on television. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I think that's a perfectly legitimate criticism, and I, I, I would agree. I, I think that one, there's one whole organizational thing that you do need to bear in mind is that, um, let's go back to NPR for a moment. you, you got to remember that um, uh, 
Uh, terrestrial radio is what pays the bills on the pub in the public radio system, and it's also it's also the glue that holds the whole system together from an organizational perspective. And uh, and by that I mean, uh, you know, you got to remember that it's it's local public radio stations. They raise money from their local audiences to buy the national programming that NPR produces, and for NPR to then produce things like podcasts that go over the local stations threatens that entire model. Um, and uh, and so uh, you know I, I don't I don't really see these organizations themselves actually living much longer. I don't think that NPR is. I mean, it, it, there may be some rump of it left, but I don't I don't think that it's going to persist as 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 a vibrant company as, a, as an organization for much longer than 10 to 20 years. Um, I don't really necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. I just don't think it's, a, it's an organization that's suited to the digital marketplace. What I care about is the content and whether or not people are making smart, important things. Um, and, and you, you know, you guys have been talking, I mean, Dan, you have been talking about NPR and public radio as being one of the same, or PBS and public television as being one of the same, and they're not. Yeah. Uh, public radio is a broader ecosystem, and you have other players like uh, the Public Radio Exchange, PRX, that is a digital-first audio content network that is doing wonderful things. Um, and that's really more where I see the future, not so much with, uh, so much with NPR. Uh, Mike, do you have a final comment before we wrap up, and then uh, we'll sum up in the last, final segment? Let's end this segment and the final segment. I'll give both Adam and Mike a chance to sum up their thoughts, and we'll do that in a moment. I've been spending the last hour and a half or so talking with Adam Ragusi and Mike Spindell about national public radio and public broadcasting uh, on television. Uh, we've disagreed on some things. We've agreed on some things. Uh, let me just get both of them to take a minute or two to sum up their views. Uh, let me start with you, Adam. You basically uh, and Mike seem to be in agreement that uh, at least the, the television side seems to be on its last legs. Uh, let me just ask you before I, you sum up, where do the dollars for that go if uh, PBS goes in the tank in, say, 2025? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I, you know, the, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, their appropriation has been holding steady in recent years at about uh, $450 million. That's what Congress puts aside for public broadcasting. And there are lots of people, I've been one of them, who have said that more of that money needs to go to um, to players in public media who are not the the old the old hats. You know, uh, anyone who is doing um, interesting value, anyone who is creating interesting, valuable, elevating media that the marketplace is not going to pay for, should be eligible for those CPB grants. It shouldn't just be public radio and television stations that are getting that money. And to a certain extent, you've seen CPB actually responding to that criticism and funding some less conventional players out there in the public media system. I just mentioned PRX, that's that's one of them. Um, so I, I see some hope there. Uh, I The one thing that I do hope is that I hope that as the old system of public broadcasting fades into uh, fades out of its useful existence, I hope that the idea of spending taxpayer dollars on media doesn't go away. I hope that we still think that it's important to, as a people, to come together and to take some of our public treasure and put it into creating media that is important and wouldn't otherwise be created. I hope that we keep that value. Um, and I think the way that we keep that value is to start spending more and more of that CPB appropriation on, um, you know, things like, 
you know, so Dan, there's a podcaster named Dan Carlin who does a history podcast. Dan Carlin Hardcore History is incredibly smart, incredibly valuable. I think that he should be eligible for CPV money, you know. Um, if we look over at PRX, they have a podcasting network called Radiotopia that does a lot of very, very smart shows. There's a show called 99% Invisible that's all about design and uh you know, sort of the hidden aspects of all of the main objects that make our world the way that it is. And that show is in part subsidized by public dollars because PRX gets some CPB money. So I see a lot of hope there. I hope that we continue to put that money into that kind of stuff. My fear is that um, the incumbents in the public media space the old school public television stations and radio stations, that they will continue to use their their political power and their hold on that money to hold on to that money long past after the point where they should. And then there's going to become a moment where everyone's going to look at public television and say, listen, this is a pointless vestige. No one is watching it anymore. And yet we are still appropriating $450 million for it every year. Let's just zero that out on the next federal budget. I'm afraid that that's what might happen. So that's, well, that's where I'm before, before I go on to Mike, I just want to make a comment on one thing you did. It's, it's interesting you mentioned Carlin because I did try to interview Carlin. And while I think that, that funding uh, individual podcasts is, is, is good, the, there are, I think, a lot better history channels that do that. And the reason I say that, and this gets back to what I've been talking about with some of these other people in, in the arts, is Carlin makes history on his podcast almost like a melodrama or a soap opera where he brings in elements that have no historical background. I don't mind, I don't mind funding uh, that if that was gonna, going to be considered, say, an entertainment show, as long as it's not given as history, because, because his, his history, and I'm not talking, and I've, I've read up about him, his history is very questionable versus some other podcasters who do basically more straight history. So that's one of, that's, I just wanted to clarify in terms of some of the other things. Someone like a Carl and I see more as an entertainer rather than a historian. And so as long as you make the distinction that I'm funding him as an entertainer rather than a historian, I don't have a problem with that. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just say something really quickly before this will be the last thing I say, um, is that this has been a, a big topic of conversation in my world the last couple of weeks actually has been um, what, what, are, what are we in public media doing with podcasts? Are we creating important, uh, high value uh, educational content or are we creating things that are kind of frivolous, that are really yeah. just kind of entertainment? And I think that um, the idea that shows that we're making like NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour are more frivolous and more entertainment. I think maybe there's some legitimacy there. Maybe that's not a good example of a show because I think that's a really smart show. But um, what's also the uh, Adam Davidson, who used to be a, a, an economic supporter for NPR, and he, now he's doing a, a podcast for a for-profit uh, podcasting company called Gimlet. Uh, the point that he made that I think is very smart is that most new technologies get used to make frivolous things at first. And most new technologies are dismissed as toys at first. And that's a natural part of the cycle. As more money and more attention comes to it, I think that you're going to start seeing the medium um, uh, put into doing more substantive things. So yeah. I'm, I'm very helpful. Yeah, and it's, it's like you had that. said before, I guess my problem with a lot of it is, is just sort of uh, truth in advertising. You know, if, if, if public broadcasting wanted to do their version of TMZ and there was an audience and it subsidized good, good, good things, fine. But let's not pretend TMZ is real journalism. That's just my basic uh, bitch with that kind of thing. So Mike, no, no, they've broken some pretty important <laughs> stories. They broke the story about the football player who beat up his wife. That yeah. never would have gotten out if it had not been for TMZ. Just saying. Yeah. There's, there's valuable stuff everywhere. Mike, your final thoughts? Yeah, let me wrap it up with this. Uh, paraphrase of Schmidt. We can't bury TBS, not to praise him. But the point of the burial is not because PBS has died, but it's the media in general in the United States has walked into a new form, and it can be exciting. It could also, as, as happens with media, be trite and banal at points. Uh, but it is different. I think um, what we what we saw is we saw the natural history of a media that had its moments that is now fading out of existence to be replaced by another media. I don't find that not hopeful. Um, I'll just leave you with, with this one thought because it struck me so much. Uh, I have a daughter about Adam's age, my younger daughter. She recently
finally got herself into a job that seemingly was beyond um, her, her past resume. And she explained to me that when she sat down for the interview, they asked whether she understood various things or technological things. And she looked at the guy and said very confidently, um, maybe I don't know it now, but you give me a couple of minutes on YouTube and I'll know it as well as I can I can know it. Now where that struck me with this, I would I, 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 I just it never occurred to me in my aged existence that maybe I could go to find this great resource to teach me how to do things. This is a new sensibility. Whether it's a better sensibility or not, I don't know. But it is a new sensibility. There is a sense that there is a possibility and hope for the future. And let us hope that PBS and NPR finally become in turn, but will be replaced by something that can bring the same sort of spark. Yeah, with, with, with YouTube, I, I always tell people, though, you have to look at YouTube the way you look at Wikipedia. It's not exactly the most uh, trustworthy source. But uh, let me just say, anyone who is interested in Adam's or Mike's writings, I'll have links to their writings and websites below. Tomorrow, Mike, this might interest you, and I could send you a link. I'll be speaking with two experts on the life and career of Akira Kurosawa. So that's uh, coming up tomorrow. So I want to thank both Adam and Mike for talking about PBS and NPR. Thank you. Pleasure. See you, Mike. Nice meeting you.